Okay, well, welcome everybody to the Vermont Humanities Council event. And uh, tonight we are taking a look at the question, did the Supreme Court of the United States just hobble the administrative state? My name is Meg Mott and I wanna thank uh, the Vermont Humanities Council for organizing this program. And uh, we're very interested to hear from our audience and see what uh, their thoughts are about some of the um, busy work that the Supreme Court has done this past season. Uh, and uh, this court, this case in particular, sometimes doesn't get as much attention because of the Dobbs decision and the gun case, and even the cases that have to do with religious freedoms in the school, they've gotten a lot of attention. Uh, but I was very eager to be able to talk about this particular case, West Virginia versus the Environmental Protection Agency. And I hope that you all also will see by um, early on in this program or definitely by the end of this program, how this case has also um, created a lot of changes in how we think about the administrative state, what its authority is, and what the role of the Supreme Court is vis-a-vis -vis the administrative state. Um, my name is Meg Mott, um, and I am a constitutional wrangler is the way I describe myself. I used to teach um, constitutional law and political theory at Marlboro College, uh, which is no longer with us. And uh, I was so happy to be able to work this evening with Aaron Kosicki, who I worked with at Marlboro College, one of the first students and went on to Vermont Law School. And now Aaron Kosicki is the litigation and enforcement attorney for the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources. So he'll be one of our experts tonight as we go through this very complicated case. And Aaron was delighted to be able to get Steph Hoffman to join us um, to round out our discussion about what was at stake in this case, what the different arguments were, and how this pertains to uh, environmental law. Steph is a staff attorney at the Vermont Public Utility Commission. And so uh, many, many thanks to both our panelists. You guys are be doing a lot of work for us tonight to help us understand uh, the implications of this pretty um, important case. West Virginia versus the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, I call myself a constitutional wrangler because I am of the mind that we cannot engage in a constitutional democracy unless the citizens understand what the constitution means. And that doesn't mean there's one way to understand it, which is why I call myself a wrangler. But my uh, job, my main job since Marlboro closed has been to go around the state of Vermont, state of New Hampshire, other places in the Northeast, and talk about the constitution with the help of lawyers. I'm not a lawyer. Um, I always had aspirations to be a lawyer. It was one of those things that um, was frowned upon in my family for some reason, women could not make good lawyers. Uh, but I've also thought that it can't just be lawyers who understand the constitution. All of us need to, uh, be able to think through basic uh, principles such as are outlined in the Bill of Rights, understand the principles behind separation of powers. So uh, since Marlboro closed, I've been so happy to be able to go around the state, sometimes in person, sometimes in Zoom, and talk about the Constitution. So here's just one little quote. This is from FDR, who was also somebody who believed that the people should understand the Constitution. And that is that the Constitution is the people's document, not the lawyer's contract. However, we need lawyers, and that's why the whole jury system was set up uh, to help the people understand the technical aspects of the law. So that's what we're gonna do tonight. We're gonna wrangle with this case. Um, many of you who are watching this don't feel the fact that you don't have a JD precludes you from participating. It is the people's document. And um, Aaron and Steph are going to help us understand this case and all the implications that we have. So um, I want to get right into the case 
West Virginia versus EPA. And um, uh, what I'm gonna do first is just set out some very basic facts. And it's probably going to be the first little bit of learning curve. It's got a lot of details. So I set up a few PowerPoint slides. And once we thought through the facts together, then we're gonna go into them in far more detail uh, with the help of Steph and Aaron. So um, if you have something to write things down with, this is a good time to get it out, get your pen and paper. And let me share the first slide. Okay, so, um, and you may need to move things around on your screen in order to um, see the slide, but that's one of those things you can do now in Zoom. This case starts under the Obama administration. So one of the things we should be thinking about is administrative law takes place underneath the presidential um, purview. So whoever has been elected into the president, see, has quite a lot of authority. So in 2015, the EPA under President Obama promulgated a clean power plan, also known as CPP as we go forward. And this plan addressed carbon dioxide emissions from existing coal and natural gas fired power plants. In order to make this shift, and it is a um, rather dramatic shift as we'll find out to asking, um, for a rule in which existing coal and natural gas fired plants need to switch to um, less carbon dioxide emissions, the EPA said, we've got this authority. It's a big change in how they've been doing things, but they said, we got it. And they cited section 111D, something else you might wanna put in your notes, of the Clean Air Act, which authorized regulation of certain pollutants from existing sources. So if, the, if you can uh, move things around on your screen so you can see my slide, uh, you'll see that you've got ca um, carbon pollutant, sorry, coal power on one side, and then a little bit you can see moving to wind. So part of the effort of the Clean Power Plan was to switch what kind of energy uh, was being used to produce uh, uh, electricity. And so this is what they call generation shifting. The clean power plan required statewide reduction of greenhouse gases through generation shifting from coal to air, uh, to wind, from coal or gas to solar. Um, West Virginia and other states sued saying, wait a minute, you can't make these changes so quick. And what they claimed is that the EPA had exceeded its authority under the Clean Air Act. The Supreme Court in 2016 stayed the Clean Power Plant. I and mean, they said, nope, you can't, they just put it in a freeze, preventing it from taking effect. Now, after 2016, new administration, new people running the Environmental Protection Agency under the Trump administration, and so on October 21st, 2018, the EPA proposed a new rule. It was called the Affordable Clean Energy Rule or ACE. And that would establish emission guidelines for states to develop plans to address greenhouse gas emiss emissions from existing coal-fired power plants, not switch out into a new form of energy creation, but from existing coal-fired fire power plants. So at that point, the states are getting completely confused. Okay, so what's going on? They filed a petition for review in the DC District Court of Appeals. And that court vacated the repeal of CPP and ACE and sent the case back to the EPA to promulgate a new rule under their section 111, section 111 rule under the Clean Air Act. Um, and so West Virginia decided we need help and they appealed to the um, Supreme Court of the United States. So um, Aaron, let me stop sharing. Um, Cause I'm hoping my, we can go back to some of these details later if necessary, but Aaron, 
I just before we get into all these nitty gritty details, could you give us some sense of the constitutional context of this case? How do administrative agencies operate within our system of government? Sure. Uh, thanks, Meg. And before I start, I just wanted to say uh, thanks again to the Humanities Council. Uh, really excited to be here. Looking forward to this discussion. Really glad to see the turnout tonight. It's uh, it's nice to see so many people interested in this in this case. And hopefully, we can uh, help bring a little information to everybody and help uh, help people understand a fairly complicated uh, you know situation and and hopefully. Uh, bring some good knowledge to folks. Um, I think also just before we start, I just need to say uh, I, I'm a government lawyer, so is Steph. I, I think it's incumbent upon us to, to mm -hmm. say very quickly that um, we have decided to take sort of certain positions as we discuss this case um, tonight. And in doing so, I just wanna make it clear that number one, uh, those aren't necessarily the positions of the agencies that we work for. I work for the Agency of Natural Resources, Steph works for the Public Utility Commission, but we talk about these issues. These are not positions of our, of our employers, nor is it necessarily our, our personal uh, opinions about this case. I think Steph and I would agree that we, we would probably land in the same place uh, personally on this case. But for the purposes of tonight's discussion, we're going to take different sides to help sort of tease out some of these issues. Um, but to answer my next question, I think first and foremost, it's, a, it's important to take a step back very quickly and sort of sort out the question of, well, where do administrative agencies authority come from? And I think it's, you know, we can start with the sort of a civics 101. And if you remember back in, from high school, your high school days, there are three branches of government. Uh, the first one is the legislative branch. That's Congress. Uh, that's the state legislatures. Those, you know, those are the bodies that that create the law, they write the law, they, they, they're the genesis of, of the laws that we have. And those laws that are written by Congress are called statutes. So when we going forward and we talk about statutory authority, we're speaking about the laws that the legislatures have drafted and, and passed. Um, secondly, you have the executive branch, that is the president. And as part of the executive branch, uh, there are administrative agencies. For instance, I work for the Vermont Agency of Natural Resource, of course, that is an executive agency uh, that is under Governor Phil Scott. Likewise, the, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency on the federal side is an executive agency that lies within the executive branch. Um, so it, it is sort of an extension of the, of the president, so to speak. And those agencies and obviously the president are there to, to execute the laws that are passed by, uh, by Congress. Third, there's obviously the judicial branch, which is the courts. They are charged with interpreting uh, the statutes and other uh, sources of law and sort of piece things together when there is and interpret those laws when there are disagreements about what it is uh, the laws actually say. And a lot of that exercise tends to revolve in some degree about what did, what did the legislature intend when they wrote these laws? And I think that's gonna be a big part of tonight's discussion. Um, in terms of what agencies do, which is I think the, the focal point of, of our discussion tonight is, is they have a couple of functions um, and they get their authority primarily through two sources. Number one is, is there's Congress um, delegates certain authority to administrative agencies, to the executive. And they do that through uh, laws that are called enabling statutes. And what happens is, is Congress or the state legislatures write a law that says, we're going to grant this executive agency, the EPA, uh, you know, the Department of Homeland Security, any, any of the agencies that, that, you, that you're aware of, we're going to grant them the ability to do certain things. And, you know, and, and it, those agencies can only do the things that Congress says that they can do. So you can do X, Y, and Z, but you can't do A, B, and C. And the, usually the, the enabling statutes are pretty, well, they're relatively clear about where agency authority is. The second piece where agency authority comes from is the Administrative Procedures Act. And that is a set of laws um, that's pretty well established that, that lays out a lot of detail in terms of how agencies have to go about doing certain things. And agencies do generally two things. One is that they adjudicate, uh, they adjudicate issues that are within their expertise um, and, in some ways, like they will issue permits um, if people need a permit that the agency requires, like a clean air permit or something like that, or an emissions permit, things like that. 
Um, and secondly, what we're going to talk about tonight is rulemaking. And through enabling statutes and through the a process outlined in the Administrative Procedures Act, uh, agencies are able to promulgate rules. And in doing so, there's a pretty robust public participation process that's involved in that. It's a multi-year process. It, it, there's a lot of steps that they have to follow, but if they follow all those steps uh, in rulemaking, the rules that they come out with have the force of law. So it is they, they have similar force uh, statutes, but they are created by the administrative agencies and not by Congress. And that's part of the crux of this case. Um, and the, the clean power, and to be very clear, the clean power plan, which is the focus of tonight's discussion, was um, was a set of was a, was promulgated by rulemaking. It was not something that was written by the legislature by Congress. It was promulgated by uh, the EPA, and so I think that's a that's a key bit of context there. So, and, and do you just want to just so we can clarify that that rulemaking is what follows this very specific procedure, that it's the procedure itself that makes it a, a actual rule as opposed to, I, I just wanna make sure everybody understands that. Sure, there's, there's, there's two pieces to that. The first one is, is does the enabling uh, statutes that get, does the, does, has Congress given uh, a specific agency the, the power to create rules with respect to an issue? And a lot of enabling statutes say just that. You can, you can go into, you can look at statutes that are written and legislatures will say, we want this agency to write rules about this particular thing. Mm -hmm. So once they do that, they have the authority to do that. And then they, they use the Administrative Procedures Act, which sort of goes through a fairly well-defined process that includes, again, a lot of public participation, outreach with various groups that may be impacted by the rule. And they go through a rigorous process in, in evaluating how to best structure a rule to achieve you know, the ends that the that the, uh, the agency wants to achieve here. Um, and again, that is usually a, a multi-year, you know, a multi-year process from front to back. And there's a lot of uh, opportunities for engagement, public engagement. And so it has to, the rulemaking process has to adhere to those requirements of the APA in order for it to be uh, considered to be valid, generally speaking. Great, thank you. And um, Aaron, could you also just tell us, um, before this case, the West Virginia versus EPA case, what were the, because so much of this is set up through case law, what were some of the cases that you all used to understand the relationship of the authority of the agencies? Sure. I, I think the primary case that sort of lurks in the background of this case, which is sort of the, the historically how, uh, you know, the courts sort of, when, when courts looked at agency action, they used a, a test called it's called Chevron deference, and that's a case from called Chevron versus the National Resources Defense Council back in uh, 1984. Mm -hmm. And in that case, the Supreme Court looked at uh, whether or not how is how it was going to evaluate how it was going to determine whether or not agency action was going to be valid or not. And they basically came up with a very, very simply put. There is this is an oversimplification of it. It's, it gets kind of complicated, but generally the courts have to look. They look to see whether or not Congress was has this has a statute on point that speaks to agency authority, or if it's ambiguous. So if the court, if the legislature says, um, you know, EPA, you know, if Congress says EPA has the ability to regulate this specific uh, pollutant in the air through these means. It is on point, and that's the only thing they can do. But if it's sort of ambiguous, if it says something like, for example, uh, EPA can regulate pollutants, well, you know, there's a little, there's a bit of an ambiguity there, like what constitutes a, a, a pollutant. The agency can then take that sort of authority if there's some ambiguity about it, and provided that there there's a reasonable interpretation of the statute, if the agency interprets that statute reasonably to infer that it has the ability to uh, to act, the court will generally will generally defer to the agency when they do that. They will say, "All right, like it seems reasonable that you guys interpreted this statute, this your your enabling statute reasonably. We're gonna we're gonna defer to your judgment on this because it's a recognition that usually these agencies who are full of experts 
have a better understanding of this issue than, than even courts do. Um, there's some limitations that have been put on that over the years, but that's generally the gist of it. Um, and then the other case that I think is worth noting is, is Massachusetts versus EPA, and that's a 2007 case. That's a case where actually um, the, the court did not give EPA deference. Um, in 2003, uh, the, the EPA under the Bush administration said, uh, we don't have the authority to regulate tailpipe emissions, uh, you know, greenhouse gases from, tail, from, from cars. Um, and so a bunch of states sued, about a dozen of them, Vermont included, and said, hey, you, you guys clearly have the authority to do this under the Clean Air Act. And um, in the end, the Supreme Court agreed and said, yes, the, the Clean Air Act uh, gives uh, the EPA the ability to regulate uh, greenhouse gases from uh, tailpipe emissions. Uh, so that's, that's sort of the, the background in which, the, the, the very, very general background from which this case sort of flows. And thanks, because those two cases we see gave the agency, specifically the EPA, a lot of discretion in, in being able to interpret uh, exactly what they could do. Um, Steph, before we get to the details of the case, can you just give us some background on the Clean Air Act and the Clean Power Plan? Um, the Clean Air Act being the source for the EPA and the Clean Power Plan being that Obama era regulation. Yes, and thank you, Meg, and thank you, Jacob. Um, I just uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here and have this conversation. I'll echo um, <clears throat> Aaron's sentiment that it's wonderful to have these conversations, it's wonderful to be part of um, an event like this where we can have these conversations in a dialogue with members of the public. And I hope that we get to some interesting questions later and, and continue this conversation into the future. So thank you. Um, so the I think the important background here about the Clean Air Act and the Clean Power Plan rule um, is actually really informative to the way the court looks at this case. So these facts are sort of important background, but they're also critical to the way that they look at this decision by EPA as a, as a deviation from the status quo, as a major step um, in a new direction. And so there are three air pollution regulatory programs for stationary sources, such as power plants, things that are fixed emit emission sources. The first is the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, or NACS program. The second is the Hazardous Air Pollutants, or HAP program. And the third is the New Source Performance Standards Program, and that's where the rule that we're talking about in this case lives. Um, NACS and HAP identify specific pollutants for EPA regulation, sort of what Aaron gave as the example of, of the very specific delegation by Congress if you, if you um, name the pollutant, let's say. And if the pollutant doesn't fall under NACS or HAP, then it can be regulated under the new source performance standard program. So that program is essentially a catch-all, if you will. But there is a bit of an argument about from the court about that. But I think for common understanding, that is what its intention was, is to be a sort of catch-all for non-specifically named pollutants. And that is where carbon dioxide is regulated in the context of this case, because it was not subject to NAAQS or HAP. It wasn't listed as a toxic pollutant. So... From the Clean Air Act, which sets up these different pollutant regulatory programs, the EPA was authorized to regulate power plants by setting emissions standards for certain pollutants, whether they were named under NACS or HAP, or whether they were being regulated under the New Source Performance Standard Program, based on a, a, a sort of standard that's called the Best System of Emissions Reduction, or BSER. And according to the BSER, the EPA would set that standard, that best system, whatever the system might be, whether that's um, clean catch systems on a coal emissions plant or it's a larger system, which is what the dissent argues here was intended under the um, new source performance standard, whether that's systemic, right? It's across the entire system and you're trying to cause generation shifting, but you can implement that system for emission reduction. And so EPA set a BSER for existing coal plants, 
based on three building blocks um, that we'll talk about the majority's characterization of a little bit later, but those blocks are first heat rate improvements, practices that coal plants could undertake to burn coal more efficiently. Those are kind of the more traditional at the plant um, sources of regulation on pollutants. The second is a shift in electricity production from existing coal-fired power plants to natural gas-fired plants. And the third is a shift from both coal and natural gas-fired plants to low or zero carbon generating capacity, primarily wind and solar, what Meg was talking about in that image and, and demonstrating in that image. Um, under the sort of CPP, this shift would take place um, through a variety of mechanisms. One would be to reduce the plant's own production of electricity. So that's tamping down on coal-fired plant production generation. Mm -hmm. Another would be to build a new ga gas plant, wind farm, or solar install installation, or invest in someone else's existing facility of those types and increase generation there. And third, it was to purchase emission allowances or credits as part of the cap and trade regime. So that's the sort of uh, we're generating dirty power over here, and they're generating clean power over there, and there's a certain credit assigned to that clean power's generation, and essentially you can do your dirty generation so long as you purchase enough of those clean credits to make up for the bad pollutants you're putting into the, into the air. The purpose of this shifting that was implemented through the CPP was to achieve a, a sector-wide shift from coal to natural gas and renewables, as Meg mentioned, there was a, if you will, a policy intention there. And EPA then had to translate the BSER into an actual operational emissions limit. And it settled on what it deemed a reasonable amount of shift based on modeling. And the modeling took into account how much more electricity, natural gas and renewable sources could supply without causing first an undue cost increase or two, a reduction of overall power supply. So basically the cost benefit analysis is being done there says, how much more power can we get from renewables and from natural gas across the generation grid all over the United States um, reasonably within a specific time frame through the expansion of those generation sources and the tamping down on coal sources without it costing the coal plants investment in these other technologies, et cetera, that are way beyond a reasonable level, but also without decreasing our power supply to a point where we cannot supply the grid with enough power over the course of that period of time. And they ended up setting a goal for 2030 to reduce um, natural, uh, national electricity generation from, to 27% from 2014's 38% level. So basically an 11% reduction over an approximately 16 year period. So that's sort of the background of what the CPP was attempting to do and how it did it and where its basis came from in Section 11 of the Clean Air Act. Thank you, Steph, because I know that is super complicated and, and it, you've given us a, a, a wonderful understanding of what the intent was to pass the CPP, um, why it was a big push, uh, and um, all the elements of trying to get uh, uh, states to reduce their carbon footprint and how they had to do that through very specific uh, language. So um, let's now turn to the reasoning of the court. And um, I wanna let our audience know that if you have any questions along the way and you wanna put it in chat, uh, please feel free to do that. We know this was probably the most technical element of the, of the evening is to give you a sense of what the big overview was and particularly what was um, what the Obama administration was trying to do under the clean power plant, uh, clean power plan. So Steph, could you start uh, by giving us a sense of what the court's argument was in this case? And sometimes freezing uh, happens. I, oh, there we go. Can go everyone ahead. hear me? Okay, I just want to make sure my connection is stable. Yeah, it's a little, it's feeling a little, uh, well, go for it. Let's see if we can go for it. Um, and if we have any trouble, then um, we'll go to Aaron and then go back to you. Okay, I think it's a little bit better now. So just interrupt me, shout out if I'm, I'm not clear. Okay. 
So the majority uh, written by Chief Justice Roberts in West Virginia versus EPA stated that the Clean Air Act did not provide EPA with the power to pass the Clean Power Plan rule because essentially it engages in an electric generation shifting approach to the production of energy in the United States, which is outside of EPA's authority to make that decision. So put simply, the CPP goes beyond EPA's rulemaking authority. And I'll link it back a little bit to what Aaron was talking about earlier, the delegation from Congress, the, the um, enabling legislation, the enabling statute that gave them the authority to act in this area at all, which is, um, what we were just talking about and where, where the Clean Air Act goes to, didn't give EPA the authority to specifically promulgate a rule to do generation shifting from coal to other sources of power. The majority gets to that conclusion um, through a couple of steps. First of all, according to the majority, for over 50 years, EPA set standards for air pollutant emissions based on measures that reduce pollution at the plant, forcing individual plants to operate more cleanly. That is that sort of first traditional heat rate improvements category that I was talking about a moment ago, where you implement a practice at the plant to change the emissions from that facility. But it wasn't about what that facility is doing in relation to the rest of the grid. Um, the majority then goes on to say that the 2015 CPP rule was a massive departure under which existing coal-fired power plants must reduce their production of electricity and essentially subsidize generation by natural gas, wind, and solar sources. And this was an improper use of the new source performance standard program which they also said was only used a very few times, a very few times historically by EPA to promulgate rules in this area. And thus such a departure deviation was not appropriate use for that rule. Um, the majority really is getting to a, a one central issue in making that determination. That's whether Congress in fact meant to give power to the EPA as EPA was using it in this case. For the first time, the Supreme Court explicitly invoked the major questions doctrine and it, the term major questions doctrine to strike down an agency rule. Well, what does that doctrine mean? What does it say? There's a lot of debate in this case about that, but the way the majority I think best said it was there are extraordinary cases that call for a different approach, cases in which the history and the breadth of the authority that the agency has asserted and the economic and political significance of that assertion provide a reason to hesitate before concluding that Congress meant to confer such authority. That's the, the quote. Essentially, that means that courts expect Congress to speak clearly and definitively if Congress wishes to assign to an agency decisions of vast economic, political, social, et cetera, significance. And why is that? Because agencies, according to the majority, have only those powers given to them by Congress explicitly, and Congress intends to reserve for itself the right to make major policy decisions and not leave those decisions to agencies to make because that would be agency policymaking, which is prohibited by things like the separation of powers that Aaron was explaining earlier. The policymakers, the legislators are the legislative branch of government and not the executive branch. According to the majority, this doctrine, the major questions doctrine arises when agencies assert highly consequential power beyond what Congress could reasonably be understood to have granted to them. So in summary, if Congress wants to shift power production away from coal-fired plants to natural gas and renewables, it will pass legislation saying explicitly that that's its intent. It will authorize EPA to make rules to carry out that specific policy, and then you could have something like CPP put into place. But without that authorizing legislation that's explicit on this major policy determination, EPA can't go out on a limb and do that policy legislating on its own. So that's what the majority concludes. I'll just right. give a quick nod to Gorsuch's concurrence, which is um, a very high level analysis, much akin to what Aaron gave us just a few moments ago about the importance of separation of powers and also a concept called federalism, which says that at the federal level, a lot of these rules are sort of um, more strict, more strict about the separation of the different government entities and 
their authority is limited, whereas the delegation to states to make decisions about policy, those are the laboratories for experimentation and for testing out theories about whether we should do these types of limitations on different power plants. So according to Gorsuch, um, you basically would have a very strict, limited view, just like the majority had about what agency authority is, but you would maybe test something like this out either without congressional authorization at the state level. And just as a sort of a, a side or an asterisk on that, um, the states themselves do have a role in the, in the Clean Air Act um, world, which is once EPA passes these emission standards, then it's up to the states to effectively carry out those emission standards for sources within their boundaries. So that's where the concurrence um, landed. And there's some great commentary in the dissent that I'll leave to Aaron on both of those points. And I, and I see the floor to, to Mr. Kosicki. Okay, great. Thank you, Steph. And Aaron, do you want to give us a sense of what the dissent argued? Sure. I mean, in a nutshell, uh, the dissent was written by Justice Kagan. It was joined by Justices Sotomayor and Breyer. They're now those three justices are now sort of known as the as the liberal wing of the of the court at this point. Um, in short, um, Justice Kagan's dissent is admittedly a little. I would characterize it a little more bark than bite. Um, but it is still, I think it, there's a lot of valid points in there. But put it, to put it very succinctly, she's basically said to Justice Roberts, "You're nuts. There's, you know, what are you talking about? This is a this is a new sort of approach to looking at uh, agency authority, and you know, and more to the point, the ways that we have looked at agency authority in the past." all point to uh, EPA being well within the bounds of their authority to pass uh, the, clean, uh, the, clean, the clean power plan. Um, I think there's I think one sentence in particular in her dissent sort of, I think sort of sums up or sort of frames up the issue that she sees it best, which is, uh, quote, although the majority offers a flurry of complaints that come down in the end to this, the clean power plan is a big new thing issued under a minor statutory provision. So again, I think it's, as Steph was saying, is there's two pieces to this. One is the she claims that the majority is saying, "Oh, the clean power plan is just too big and has too many important, you know, issues that are sort of wrapped around it to allow for an agency to to you know issue a rule related to it when there's big, you know, complicated impacts that are at play here." And secondly. Uh, section 111 that Meg and, and Steph have talked about earlier, it's this really minor, ish, minor, uh, you know, piece of the Clean Air Act that's never been used. And so why would we possibly rely on that little piece, uh, that little statute to sort of be the underpinning of such a large uh, rulemaking? So I'll break it into those two pieces. I think first on the sort of, this is not, a, you know, the, the idea that it's not, Kagan seems to suggest that the, the Section 111 isn't a minor statutory provision. And she says, basically, you know, Congress broadly authorized the EPA to create a best system of emissions reduction. And she focuses really in on this question of like, well, what is it? What is a system here? You know, if you just read the statute. You know, we look at it, Congress that, you know, allowed for the EPA to create a system and a system is a lot of disparate parts put together to create a, 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 a you know, you fit different pieces together to create a whole that addresses an issue. And here, through these three building blocks that Steph was talking about, one is sort of the technological, uh, you know, fixes at the plants themselves, and also these two generation shifting uh, blocks. This is the system that Congress was contemplating when they wrote that, when they said it's the best system of emission reductions that the EPA is tasked with creating here. Um, she also notes that there's some pretty reasonable constraints on sort of EPA's ability to promulgate this rule. Namely, the Clean Air Act requires that uh, the agency in its rulemaking has to take into consideration the costs associated um, with the rulemaking and also uh, sort of other non-air impact, uh, non-air impacts. And you also have to rely on something that has a fairly proven track record. And here she says, look, the EPA in this case 
went through a rigorous cost cost benefit analysis that I think Steph was talking about before, where they sort of evaluated, okay, well, with this generation shifting uh, that we're proposing, what is the impact uh, to generate to the to the overall grid stability? What, what are we talking about in terms of uh, the the price to consumers? And through that, and it's a very technical, rigorous analysis that they went through, and in the end, they determined that that the generation shifting. Uh, that they that they ultimately landed on uh, the benefits of that approach outweighed these other costs. Um, also, you know, it's, it's noteworthy to say that a lot of what's asked about here, uh, a lot of what's discussed here, is sort of taken from a cap and trade model that you know has been in place in a number of jurisdictions, and so this sort of generation shifting already occurs here, and so this is nothing really new. Um, I think it's also. Justice Kagan also points out that Congress specifically back in 1977, there was some amendments that were being proposed to the Clean Air Act. And at, the, at that point, Congress uh, proposed some language that might have limited and might have been sort of limited EPA's authority to do this thing under this sort of uh, best system approach. And ultimately Congress didn't decided to decline to add additional language on there to limit it which indicates to her that Congress said, hey, you guys have a wide berth here and, you, you know, and, and this is sort of, this rulemaking is consistent with that. Um, the second piece that Kagan talks about is, is look, the CBP isn't a, isn't a big new thing. Again, it's sort of modeled after uh, the cap and trade systems that we have here. And she says, look, in the past, you know, the court has really struck down agency actions only in two specific instances. One is where the agency is operating Sort of well outside their traditional area of expertise. And she says, look, like regulating greenhouse gases is well within the expertise of EPA, like as we discussed in Massachusetts versus EPA. And also the generation shifting again that we're talking about in the CPP is something that's akin to cap and trade, which is has really well, has a really good track record. The second point place where sometimes you see uh, uh, the courts strike down agency action is when sort of a rule, an agency action just conflicts with the, like the sort of the broader kind of back, the, the broader purpose of the statute in which they're making the, the, in which they're acting. So in this case, the question is, is does the CC, does the CPP sort of conflict with the overall goals of the Clean Air Act? And the answer to that is no. Regulating, you know, regulating greenhouse gases is completely consistent with what the Clean Air Act, uh, you know, has, has done here. So, uh, you know, it's a lot of that, you know, in the in the EPA sort of couched their decision making in is is, you know, regulating greenhouse gas emissions through and and reducing the use of, reducing reliance on coal fired plants is uh, helpful to uh, public health and safety that's consistent with uh, the Clean Air Act. So that, and she goes into some detail and we'll talk about this later, sort of, I think the crux of this case in a lot of ways is how the different sides um, sort of want to approach how you read the language here. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but that, those are sort of the, the broad brushstrokes of, uh, of Justice Kagan's dissent. Great, thank you, uh, Aaron, for giving us a sense of what Justice Kagan, like her, what's going on. Uh, she saw enough authority underneath the uh, Clean Air Act for the EPA to do that. Um, so we have um, uh, one question that's come in from the audience and I'm, I'm gonna just take that first and then I've got a couple questions for you. Um, for, uh, for a question from Annette, Vermont's Public Utility Commission contains as part of its mission, guiding the development of state utility policies. Does this language extend policy making to the PUC? And if so, how, if so, how, and are there any limits? So here's a question along the same kind of concerns. What are the limits on the uh, administrative agencies in the state of Vermont? So um, Steph, do you wanna take Annette's question? So I think actually this is a good time um, before I, attempt to address the actual question on its face to talk a little bit uh, just for a second about how interpretation of statutes works. And Aaron had talked a bit about um, the Chevron deference concept and whether agencies are given the authority to interpret the statutes that, that they are regulated by or they are enabled by. 
And so just for a second, I'd like to talk about how that works. So when you have a question of statutory interpretation or when you have a question of delegated authority to an agency through a statute, um, you have to look at the plain language of that statute to discover its original intent. And to discover that intent, courts who are often the ones doing that interpreting look to the words of the statute and apply their usual and ordinary meanings. If, however, looking at the language of the statute, and Aaron gave the example of the pollutants generally, um, you know, EPA is charged with regulating pollutants, then if that meaning remains unclear, courts will then attempt to understand the intent of the legislature by looking at things like legislative history or other related sources, and courts will steer clear of any interpretation that will, let's say, for example, result in an absurd result that the legislature did not intend. They use various rules, which are called canons of statutory interpretation, to drill down on what that language might mean. And some of those rules, just some examples, would be um, statutes should be internally consistent. Um, or when the legislature enumerates an exception to a rule, one can infer that there are no other exceptions to the rule. Or, for example, um, where legislation and case law conflict, the courts will presume that the legislation takes precedent, or the court may look at things like the common usage of a word, other cases, other dictionary definitions, parallel reasoning, punctuation, grammar. They use all these tools to drill down and interpret what a statement mm -hmm. Um, of the legislature means when we're assessing it, in this case, 50 years later to ascertain what the original intent, in the case of West Virginia versus EPA, not in the case of Ms. Smith's question. Um, and they will, they will certainly use all these tools, but really this is an exercise in applying a set of various rules or canons that allow you to interpret things um, but it is not necessarily ascertaining what a lot of people would hope to ascertain, which is what exactly was the intent at the time this legislation was drafted. And this is where you get into all sorts of debates about, are you a textualist or are you a, you know, a, a founders, uh, sort of the strict interpretations type person and, and court. And so these are the, the tools that we have to assess what whether a legislative delegation to a state agency or to a federal agency um, what it means and how do we interpret it and how do we apply it? And then what comes in as another layer in that is what Aaron was talking about earlier with Chevron deference, which is, is the agency tasked with this interpretation of its own enabling legislation, the expert on that interpretation or not? And often that the deference um, applied to that agency determination or decision will depend on uh, the court's interpretation of what it means, but sometimes it also depends on the outcome that is sought to be achieved. So if the court wants a particular outcome, they might use certain tools that get you to that outcome, and you'll see the use of those tools across the majority and descendant, descent opinions in West Virginia versus EPA being used in these different ways and honestly um, reinterpreted or, or reapplied in ways that we might never have seen before, Hence the major questions doctrine and what where does that fit in all of this? And so I'm sure we'll get to that in a bit. But um and, and actually just... just because we have very limited time, because we're starting to move down towards the end of the hour, I, I'm I'm wanting to uh, push a little bit more on this question of limits. So we had certain uh questions prepared ahead of time, but I'm gonna jump ahead to one of the questions that I see uh, uh, uh under this question we have from Annette Smith which is what about this uh, business of limits? Because um, a person could say, well, gee, why should an agency have so much authority? And an agency is not an elected uh, person. If you put it through Congress and you don't like what they came up with, then you know, the next election, if it's the House of Representatives, you can vote them out. So I'm, I'm curious, maybe uh, we'll turn to first to Aaron and then to Steph. Like, um, what is it, why, why is it that you believe, because uh, you're speaking now for the dissent, that uh, administrative agencies shouldn't have more oversight, shouldn't have more limits on them? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's a good question. And that's, I mean, I think that's a, a lot of it is the core of what this case, you know, sort of revolves around. And, 
you know, again, I, I think that fundamentally there is a philosophical argument being made by the majority here that revolves around sort of gorgeous, Gors Justice Gorsuch's discussion about the separation of powers. And if, if you really want to ground your understanding of how administrative agencies should work, you want to live in that world because it is, it is a, you know, it is one where you can sort of pontificate about what the framers thought and how this grand structure of, uh, you know, American government, you know, has these very clear, uh, clean lines and we should strive to achieve, you know, the separation and be mindful of that and everything that we do. Well, that's not how the world works, you know, today. Um, we live in an increasingly complicated and frankly technocratic society and the rise of the administration, administrative state started in the 1970s, generally around the same time that these big environmental uh, statutes that are, you know, environmental acts that we're talking about now, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, things, things of those natures that created huge sort of areas of uh, regu regulatory authority that needed to be sorted out and enforced and all these things. So you, you have these uh, you know, agencies that have to deal with these very complicated issues fairly nimbly. And more importantly, you have to really rely on uh, agency expertise. And I think that's critical here. I mean, for instance, if, you know, and I think the, a good way to look at it is, is you want the, you do want the legislatures to set the broad parameters of how you want society to be uh, so, you know, what limits on behavior there is and where you want the law to be, but you want to allow for those that are really steeped in sort of the, the nitty gritty in these areas to make, to figure out ways to achieve those broader goals. I think a very simple example would be, of course, you want the legislature to be able to say, as we think it's a good idea that people have licenses to drive cars and we want those cars to be registered. But you don't want to ask your legislature to outline all of the processes that are involved in how you get your driver's license and how you register your car. That's what the DMV is for. And I, I think we would all agree we would, notwithstanding our, you know, our, our, our personal experiences with the DMV, those are the people that have uh, you know, the expertise and, and really understand procedurally how these, how the mechanics of these certain things. Um, so I, I think there's that. The second piece I would just say very briefly is, is we ought to put faith in, and I think Kagan sort of, Kagan's dissent doesn't, doesn't speaks to this a little bit, um, at the, the tail end, but I think it's a very important point is, which is administrative agencies are, you know, they exist to be responsive and, 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 you know, that's what they're there to do. And part of that responsiveness through the Administrative Procedures Act is there is, a, again, there is a robust opportunity for public participation. And that participation is built into the system on a number of different levels for a reason. It's, it's easy to say that the administrative state is insulated from the people because they're not directly, uh, you know, elected. However, any agency action, especially in the rulemaking context, is, is fairly limited. It's fairly pres prescribed in terms of how it goes about its business. And it has to be responsive, not only to the expert's understanding of an issue, but also has to take into account, you know, a lot of uh, perspectives from potential stakeholders and those that are affected by these things. That's a way to sort of bring in uh, a democratic piece to this, even though uh, sort of the, the administrative state isn't directly elected. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. And Steph, I know I, I cut you off a little bit to get to that issue of limits, but did you want to add anything to that? I think if you're coming at this question from the majority's perspective, strictly speaking, um, the the notion that an administrative agency would be limited or constrained in various ways is important because you want to impose those limits in order to ensure that agency action is there that there is accountability and that accountability from the majority's perspective comes from uh, elected representatives of the people who are acting in Congress and that's a it's appropriate to constrain their their actions based on those separation of powers principles that Aaron began speaking about at the at the beginning of his response to this question. If you do not have um, 
sort of checks on agency authority so that you're limiting the areas that they can act in, then the policymaking that they're doing in those areas um, sort of doesn't get addressed unless and until a court decides that their action was unconstitutional or the Congress legislates around the action that's been taken by the agency. And I think we're going to talk about that in the context of this case a little bit as well. But the invitation from the majority is one that says, hey, yeah, that's exactly what we want. In major areas of policy, let's let Congress make the decision and less them until they make it. The agencies don't, don't get to do it in advance. And I think the majority, what they are clear about here is that the EPA doesn't um, they're, they are not, uh, in overturning the EPA's decision, they are not saying that EPA went too far because they don't have the authority to regulate carbon dioxide emissions or that they don't find that, or that, that, that the court is finding that generation shifting is the wrong policy approach to this emissions problem. They're saying that, hey, hold up a second, you didn't do this to the right process. And the right process is to have Congress act so that you can have um, elected officials who are responsible to the people if, they, if the people don't like these decisions to regulate carbon emissions in these ways by generation shifting, they can pull those people out of office by not voting for them and supplant, you know, supplant them with someone else who they do agree with their emissions policy approaches. Great. Thank you. Uh, another question that's come in the chat is uh, somewhat of a cynical question, but these are also important for us to think about. Don't you all think that the majority didn't want to hurt coal fired plants? And so the majority came into this, uh, Laura Block is suggesting, with a, a, an end already in sight. They did not want to um, hurt coal-fired plants. Um, any thoughts on that? Um, Steph, do you wanna take that first? I hinted at this earlier that often in statutory interpretation, you can have an end in sight and you can uh, twist and manipulate some of the tools to, to sort of get to that end. And I think, it would be difficult um, to not acknowledge that there is there are winners and losers when you have a decision such as this one. And mm -hmm. if that is preserved, if the decision of the Supreme Court in this case was preserved, you would have coal plants able to do things that they weren't in, weren't going to do on their own. Perhaps that's the majority's position um, without being told they had to do it. Now, history proves out a different sort of uh, tale here, but that is the majority's position that we need to have the things happen from the right um, from the right source. But I think you do have a situation here where I think a cynic would definitely look at the court as having picked sides, picked a winner, and declared that winner and hope to preserve that winner. However, there are definitely um, different camps on how insulated the Supreme Court is, and there's a lot to be said about that. So I'm I'm going to leave that all to everyone's sort of knowledge and imagination about uh, how we look at the court and the members of the court and the process for appointing the members of the court. But I think it's impossible as a, a body of humans to make those decisions completely insulated from all influences and um, and what the potential consequences of those decisions will be. Right. Thank you, uh, Aaron. Did you want to add anything? Yeah, that. and I think this is a little bit outside of the kind of perspective that that, that Steph just brought to this question. But I, I do, I mean, I think that it's a reasonable to question whether or not this was a decision that was uh, made with a particular uh, end in mind. But I think it's important to note here, and I won't go into the details of this, this was a really unique case in terms of how the court, how it got to the court. And in very short shrift, uh, the clean power plant never went into effect. It never became law. Um, so the court was sort of evaluating this, this delegation of authority kind of as an academic exercise. There was no real impact to it. But as Justice Kagan's dissent noted, the, the clean power plan was sort of obsolete anyway, because market forces have already moved uh, power generation away from coal. In fact, more so than even what the clean power plan contemplated. So so power coal plants, to put it differently, coal plants are already being hurt by market forces. This is not the issue. What I think uh, Kagan sort of is worried about, and I think I am a little bit too, is, is I don't think that this decision is about the EPA in this particular context. This is about a court outlining a new standard uh, via the uh, major questions doctrine as a way to 
um, sort of neuter other administrative agencies in other areas that we haven't seen yet. So just as a kind of an epilogue to this, number one, under the Inflation Reduction Act, which was the big environmental and uh, sort of social services law that went into effect uh, maybe about a month ago, Congress slipped in language into that bill that explicitly said that carbon dioxide is a pollutant for purposes of the Clean Air Act. So basically Congress has sort of shored up this issue in this context and said, giving the EPA pretty clear authority that it could regulate carbon dioxide going forward. So if you are a fan of agency action in this realm, that's helpful uh, for the EPA going forward. Um, but on the flip side, you know, you already see um, some legal experts um, sort of looking at other agency actions and applying the major questions doctrine to sort of undermine, potentially undermine the legitimacy of that action. For instance, when President Biden issued um, his executive action through the uh, uh, agency, uh, the education uh, department of uh, student loan forgiveness, there has been some chatter uh, among some uh, legal circles that question whether or not the major questions doctrine will be applied to this and whether it will ultimately, you know, that action will be struck down because there is not a clear delegation from Congress as to whether or not a president can provide uh, student debt relief sort of carte blanche. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it's, it's creeping into other areas already. So. Yeah. Thank you. So on one hand, you could say this case uh, poked Congress into action and they got that information in there and they made it explicit that carbon dioxide is a pollutant. Uh, but the other hand is this whole question of what is the court's relationship now to the um, administrative agencies? And, and uh, maybe that's something you all want to just talk a little bit about. I know we for a little bit over the hour, but this feels like, um, especially since both of you are involved in administrative law, what are some of the um, challenges now for going forward, knowing that there's very different perspectives on the relationship between the Supreme Court and administrative agencies? Um, either one of you wanna go first on this. I'll be happy to jump in. So. I think uh, at its core, the major questions doctrine really flips on its head the way statutory interpretation was conducted all time before it. Um, this is sort of an off ramp from the, the, the paradigm that I discussed a little while ago, where you take something that is not plain on its face, it is ambiguous, and you look to these sources and you apply these rules. And um, the dissent in this case talks at length about this issue. This, this major questions concept seems, at least in concept, to be an opportunity for the courts to say, whoa, 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 you exceeded your authority, EPA or any administrative agency. Pump the brakes, we're taking it back. And there's not a whole lot of walking through whether the statutory language itself gave that agency that authority to act. So when you're operating from inside of that agency, you have to ask yourself whether or not the action that you're taking in rulemaking has been authorized explicitly enough in order for you to be taking those steps. And when you do rulemaking or you do take agency action, that is not something that is done in the snap of a finger. It is something that takes quite an effort. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of um, back and forth with stakeholders, incorporation of feedback, uh, legal analysis, um, policy consideration, and um, drafting of, of documents like Aaron was describing the DMV example, setting up a regulatory uh, process, procedure, forms, mechanisms, personnel, et cetera, all of that takes time and money and effort and training. And so when you're building that regulatory framework, as I view each agency determination or each agency rulemaking is sort of this lattice of uh, that strengthens and enforces and builds out that agency's operational um, work, that process now is called into question because if the only call that's going to be made by the court as referee is, whoa, 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 you overstepped big, big policy implications. 
lots of what agencies do every day has big policy implications, impacts economic, social, and political avenues of thought. And there is an entire line of thinking that is appropriate to place some of that political decision-making in the agency's hands. We've talked a lot about, at least at a high level, Congress being an appropriate authority, but there are great reasons like expertise and continuity, whereas politicians have to respond a lot to the politicking. I mean, the stereotype that Congress can rarely get anything done on a bipartisan basis, whereas agencies are employed by folks who are on the ground doing the work, see the issues, know the know the framework, know the context, and can do that work on a day-to-day basis. And some of that politicking, at least, is not in their way. If all of those things that inform the agency carrying out and effectuating laws so that they're operational, they can every person's day-to-day experience with that agency is impacted by those agencies setting up that, that paradigm, that process, I think, really if not screeches to a halt, is done as walking on eggshells now. Because you're never sure when that that carpet's going to be pulled out from from under you and you're going to be starting over. And to Aaron's point procedurally, the posture of this case is almost uh, mind-blowing from a legal geek's perspective. You have a not, what seems like a totally moot or non-ripe or whatever word you want to use issue, Mm -hmm. Uh, colloquially I'm using it, not legally, um, issue that a court has decided to reach down and decide anyway, and if not for larger implications of making that decision, then then for what? Um, And so it's it's a very strange procedural moment. Often courts in the past would have said, no, thank you. We will wait till another day to make a decision about this issue. And that was considered to be the right procedural decision if you're looking at sort of federal courts and how they practice and whether folks have standing and whether the issue is ripe or or moot um, and et cetera, et cetera. So this is a case where they were reaching for an opportunity, I think, to make a decision that could give them uh, this doctrine that can then be used in sort of a, a way that we have not seen before to tamp down on agency regulatory authority. Yeah, thank you, Steph. And and you're getting at this uh, understanding of, it's another way of looking at Laura Block's question that what was the end game? Was it really about coal power plants? No, it could be read as uh, really changing the relationship uh, between the courts, federal courts and the administrative agencies. Um, Erin, I'm gonna give you the last word as we wrap up. We'll have a couple more moments for questions if somebody put something in the chat. Otherwise, we'll start to bring this to a conclusion. Aaron. Sure. I just wanted to, I think, dovetail a little bit off of what uh, Steph was saying about this. I, I think Steph brought up a, a, an issue that um, can't really be under, you know, can't be overstated, which is continuity is is really critical to the functioning of government, <laughs> you know, sort of across the board. And um, you know, so in Kagan's dissent, she part of her dissent, she discussed, she says, she has an argument where she says, look, Congress has delegated authority to agencies for a long, long time for really big reasons for, and to address really big issues, you know, for a long time. And this should be no different. And she basically outlines two reasons for why they do that. Number one is she says, you know, Congress understands that it can't know everything about everything. So it doesn't have the sort of expertise to, to really dig into these things. And that's, that, I think everybody understands that. But the other piece I think is just as important, which he says, Congress can't sort of understand how to legislate a regulatory program across time. So another way to look at that is, is these you know, regulatory programs evolve as facts on the ground change, as new issues arise, and the agencies are really well positioned to sort of respond to those things. And um, you know, in its in in sort of agency action creates sort of a slow moving consistency across political um, you know administrations historically that is starting to sort of be disrupted a little bit as we see more and more sort of extremes with legislatures and executive agencies. You're starting to see these swings, but I think at its core you still see some stabilization because you have agencies you know, staffed by a bunch of experts who understand these issues and know sort of have, a, have kind of a best practices approach in mind. My, my, my fear is, and I think 
part of Kagan's dissent sort of speaks to this implicitly, which is, is if what Gorsuch is really saying is, is that, you know, we want to move to a sort of a more state-based, you know, states are the laboratories, they should be doing this. There is a lot of interaction between the states and the federal government, especially with respect to these environmental issues. For instance, state of Vermont, you know, my agency has a lot of people in that are involved in enforcing, they, there's a whole set of rules on the state level that enforce the Clean Air Act and make sure that that works for Vermont. I think what this decision may end up doing because of, I think, you know, Steph was talking about the fear of having the rug pulled out from underneath them. You may see more action, you know, you might see Congress on the federal level sort of crafting legislation that gives more sort of avenues for the states to really do the, the heavy lifting on the administrative front. And you end up with different states with wildly different approaches to the salt, trying to solve the same problem. So you see sort of a more... I, I don't like to use this word, but I think it's apt here, sort of a balkanization of administrative, you know, action to try to solve, you know, problems that affect everyone in the nation. I mean, I think the, the, the prime example we see a lot of time is California leads the way in environmental regulations across the board. Um, and, you, you know, and so they've always been sort of seen as kind of separate and apart, but I think you might start seeing an even bigger sort of patchwork in different mm -hmm. states approaching these problems, which is going to end up creating problems for all the states, I think, potentially. I mean, there's just, there's just nobody knows right now, especially because I think in the end, I'll just end with this, is the major questions doctrine is new. It has not been fleshed out very well in this in this decision. And until the, the court starts to put more detail and more meat on the bones of this of this doctrine, it's a little unclear what the what the impact of this is going forward. But I think there's there's reason to, I think everybody's sort of paused right now and trying to sort of level set where we are again. Um, it's it's a kind of a new world that that we're in. A new world, still figuring out how it's all going to play out. Um, well, thank you very much uh, to our two panelists, Aaron and Steph, and thank you to Vermont Humanities and to everybody who's come out. Uh, I highly recommend that you read this decision. It's worth taking a look at. I know it hasn't gotten as much attention as some of the other high profile decisions, but I hope you know uh, or figured out after listening to both Aaron and Steph just how profound this decision is for administrative agencies going forward. So uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Jacob. Do you have any final remarks or something that you want our viewers to know about the Vermont Humanities Council? Yes, and really, again, thank you, Aaron and Seth, for taking the sides of explaining this case and its impact, and Meg for leading this discussion. This has really been informative and went back to my civics roots, and I really appreciated that. Um, and thank you again, everyone, for joining. We have some events coming up. I'll put a link in the chat for our fall festival program, Where We Land, which takes a lot of themes from our Vermont Reads uh, selection, The Most Costly Journey uh, Through Storytelling and Migrant Journeys. Um, through statewide programming for you all throughout October. Um, we look forward to seeing you there, especially if you want to continue discussions like this one we had tonight. Um, so thank you all again for coming, and we look forward to seeing you at the next one. Have a great night.